Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. This is Mr. Math. In this video, we'll be going over all of the openings for whites, and we'll be evaluating how good or bad they are to play as a new player. But first, some housekeeping. Uh, a couple things. Firstly, this won't be like a normal lecture. Uh, we won't have puzzles. So if you were uh, looking for a uh, solution to the previous lecture's puzzle, uh, you'll find that the next time I post a more traditional uh, lesson. But for this video, we're going to have a very different format. We're going to be going over uh, a lot of openings for white, and we're going to be grading them like we would grade any assignment from A to F. Uh, so A being the best, of course, and F being the worst. My grading system will be as follows. Ah, and one last thing, before I forget, before we get into the video, uh, if there are any openings where I don't go over, because this video is going to be very long already as is, and I might forget one uh, or two, or I might just not have time, uh, please let me know if there are any openings that you wanted to see graded that weren't graded for beginners, that you want advice on, or if you have any questions about any of the lines that we go over in this video, feel free to leave a comment below. I will respond as quickly as I possibly can, uh, and I might leave in the description or in a pinned comment some grades and some uh, comments on of my own on some openings or lines that I feel should be go uh, gone over that I didn't get time to get to in this video. So without further ado, let's get started. So the grading system I'll be using uses three things, solidity, learnability, and frequency. Solidity means how good is the opening? Very simply, if both sides play perfectly, is there some refutation to the opening? Or is the opening good no matter what your opponent does? Uh, learnability is quite self-explanatory. How easy is this opening to learn? Do you need to memorize a ton of different lines? Or is there a setup that you can do every single time and get away with it? And finally, frequency. How often are you actually going to be able to achieve this opening in a practical game? Does it require a string of moves that your opponent isn't likely to play? So those are going to be the three factors. I'll be grading them from A to F. And using that, I'll be also grading the openings with these factors, A to F, with A, B, and C, and then F, because these don't get degrees here, I'm afraid. So if you want to see a specific opening graded, you can skip to the end. I'll be putting the tier list uh, with the grades of all of the openings at the end. So if you want to see a specific opening, you can skip to the end. However, if you, uh, if you want to see it as more of a secret, I'll be going in order, starting from the lowest and going upwards. So we're going to start with F tier, which means the bong cloud that's right hopping right into the f tier is the bong cloud uh if you don't know what the bong cloud is it's where white moves the e-pawn up either one or two squares we'll say one square here uh, black makes a move and then you have king to e2 on the second move uh, it's quite self-explanatory why the solidity is f here uh you're blocking in your own queen bishop and knight to some degree and you're violating all the rules that i've listed out in openings 111 of uh, developing your pieces controlling center and getting your king's safety this seriously harms your ability to do all three uh, and in terms of learnability sure you might argue there isn't too much to learn but at the same time you're gonna have to, you're still gonna actually have to learn quite a bit if you ever want to play this and not lose the game uh, as for frequency it gets a begrudging A because black does not have a way to stop you, but that does not stop me from putting it into F tier because while it is a decent joke, that is all it is, a joke, and you should not be playing this as a beginner. Next up, also coming into F tier, is the hippo. The hippo is the opening where you play setup chess with moving your pawns up one square, your G pawns and B pawns up one square in order to fee and shadow your bishop, then moving your knights to D2 and E2, and this is the hippo setup. Uh, eventually, the idea is you, you get your queen out, probably by pushing the C pawn up one or two squares. Uh, sometimes you will push the F pawn and H pawn or A pawn up as well, 
depending on the scenario, and then you eventually, very slowly, get to castle to one of the sides. Uh, this is also quite self-explanatory in why the solidity is F. You're, again, just, it seems almost purposefully placing uh, none of the pieces on the squares of the perfect position. Bishops are supposed to go here. Knights were supposed to go here. Pawns were supposed to go here. Queen's supposed to go here. Uh, and you basically get nothing done that you're supposed to get done. Uh, it violates basically all the principles. It has very weak control of the center. It's particularly bad for white, actually. Uh, even worse for white than it is for black, because... You had the first move, you could have grabbed extra control of the center with any number of openings, but instead you chose to play the hippo and concede control of the center to your opponent. Opponent can very simply put pawns on d5, e5, put the knights on c6 and f6, uh, sorry, put the knights on c6 and f6, and they'll have better control of the center than you do. Uh, as for learnability, this is again a C. You might think, wait, isn't just this just set up chess? And kind of it is. But the problem is that there are too many ways for your opponent to disrupt you. Uh, how are you going to handle it if your opponent does a pawn push? What if your opponent lines up queen and bishop to do a trade on either h3 or a3? Uh, what are you going to do when your opponent goes for a battering ram on a4, uh, on the a or h files? What are you going to do when they go for a sacrifice play on d3 or e3? Uh, so there is actually a lot to learn here. Again, be, mainly because the solidity is so low, learnability gets dragged down as well. And in some ways, this is actually worse than the bonk cloud because frequency is also going to be lower because, again, you have those ways of getting disrupted because there are actually multiple variations here. And you can't just force it out on the second turn, so you won't always be able to get the setup you want. Our final contender into the F tier category is going to be the sodium attack. Uh, and of course, sodium and A, periodic elements, so therefore, it starts with the move knight A3. Uh, this is not a very good move. Again, the knight's best square is to go on C3, and it is very firmly rebutted uh, with uh, either E5 or D5, but probably D5 is the more appealing of the two options. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the knight on A3 is not really doing anything. Uh, black can very easily wall it out of the game. Uh, and if your goal was to go to c4, it's just not happening. If you really wanted to do that, you probably should have played e4 first, uh, and then gone knight d2 to c4, or maybe you could have played a queen's gambit uh, and done it that way. Uh, either way, knight a3 is not very good. It, again, continues to violate principles. Uh, learnability, I will say, is also low just because there is no game plan to actually learn after the sodium attack. There's no, because there's nothing you can get consistently. Uh, D5 answers any C4 shenanigans. And if your goal was to wrap it around to C2 by going maybe C3 and Knight C2, well, your opponent could just put E5 on the second move if they really want to. Uh, and a Knight, a Knight C4 is not a really big deal uh, because, of course, they can just play Knight C6 and then play D5 on the next move, attacking your Knight. And you're just completely conceding central control. You're moving your knight actually further away from the center for some reason. Um, the C3 square is significantly better than the C4 square is for the knight. Uh, in terms of central control, of course, uh, C3 controls 2 instead of just C4, which controls 1. Uh, admittedly, frequency is going to be an A just because, yes, you can play knight A3 on the first move every game if you would like. Uh, but you probably shouldn't do that as it is extremely unviable. And so now we're going to move into the C tier and our first entrance into the C tier. The first opening, which is not going to fail our grading, is going to be the fried liver. Uh, the fried liver goes by the opening lines e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, knight f6. And now the key move of the fried liver is coordinating this knight and bishop to play now knight g5, attacking the pawn on f7. Uh, now, the fried liver is very well known among beginners, uh, and beginners will be surprised to see, probably to see the solidity as low as it is, and uh, if you are a more advanced player, you may be surprised that I'm actually not giving solidity an F, I'm giving it a C, and you might be wondering why that is. Uh, and the reason is because, well, the fried liver isn't completely terrible. Uh, it is quite bad, and that is why it is in C tier. Solidity is not very good, uh, but it has some things going for it. 
Uh, firstly, addressing the issue of solidity. Uh, yes, black does have a very well-known rebuttal in d5, uh, ed5, knight a5, bishop b5, uh, c6, dc6, bc6. Uh, and now if you let an engine run on this, it will say black has an advantage. Uh, however, the position is not very clear. The It is not as easy as you might think for black to come out with an advantage after white's best move, which is bishop d3, uh, preparing the knight's retreat to the e4 square. Uh, or similar responses, like bishop a4 and bishop e2 can also be hard for black to rebut as well. Uh, there's also the line queen f3 here, trying to win another pawn, although I would not suggest that, because after queen f3, uh, my favorite line personally is actually rook b8, bishop captures knight captures, queen captures, and now knight d7. And the idea is black is going to play bishop b7 next turn and skewer your queen to your pawn, uh, all the while your knight is hanging on the g5 square. So, of course, this is not a very good opening, but uh, with proper defense, it can be hard for black to exploit their advantage. And of course, you do walk away up one pawn in the main variation or two pawns in the case that you play this variation and grab the c6 pawn as well. Uh, learn ability is a B because it is just that one line that you're going to look to play. However, there are complexities uh, and there are multiple lines and black does have multiple responses. Of course, d5 is not the uh, only response they could have played. Uh, and uh, there's multiple lines here. For example, while knight d7 isn't necessarily common, bishop d7 I think is more popular instead as well. Um, and of course, uh, black could choose to uh, not gambit upon at all. They could have grabbed it back uh, quite quickly if we go back a bit here. Uh, instead of playing, uh, when instead of playing c6, they could have played bishop d7 as well, and they'll grab back the pawn very quickly here. Um, so. There are a lot of lines to learn as well, uh, not as many as I would say in the previous openings, but still learnability isn't that great. Uh, it is still definitely better than the previous though. And in terms of frequency, this is probably uh, the second biggest problem with the fried liver I would say, uh, because if you go back to this position, it was a one, two, three, four move opening, and in that, that amount of time black could have deviated any number of ways. Uh, black, of course, didn't have to play e5. There are a myriad of other options here for black. Uh, they didn't have to play knight c6. Again, lots of other options. There's, there's d6, there's d5, there's knight f6, right? Uh, and here, of course, black also didn't have to play knight f6. It could have played bishop c5. Again, could have also played d6. Uh, and there's some other niche openings. There's f, uh, f5, for example. So... Uh, by no means are you going to be able to get the fried liver consistently either, uh, which makes it not very worth it for new players to try. Uh, that said, it's not completely terrible. It has its upsides in that you're probably going to be consistently winning a pawn when you do get into the fried liver. Uh, and sometimes your opponent will, of course, mess up. Uh, and you will get to capture that pawn on f7 and get a fork on the queen and the rook. So that's why fried liver is going into C tier. Our next entrance into the C category is going to be the Grob. The Grob starts with g4, and the main idea is to get quick development of the bishop. And after Black's most obvious move, which is d5, grabbing control of the center and attacking the pawn, the idea is to sacrifice this pawn most of the time, and then play bishop g2 anyway and develop the bishop immediately. Now, Black does not have to accept the sacrifice. There are plenty of reasonable moves Black can play here and play e5, knight c6. But of course, you're hoping black accepts it. And now your plan is to put pressure on this d5 pawn with moves like c4, uh, because of course the pawn is pinned to b7, and you're going to follow that up, let's say after uh, e6, with a move like queen a4 or queen b3 to apply extra pre pressure to black here. For example, uh, queen b3 here is going to fork that pawn and that uh, pawn on b7 as well as the pawn on d5. And black is going to have to make some very tough decisions. Uh, solidity is pretty low, mainly because after uh, black should be playing, uh, first of all, black can opt not to accept the pawn at all, and then after, so let's say, e5, uh, you're quite sad as white, uh, 
because uh, you've completely ceded central control to black for some reason. Uh, of course, even after they capture, black is perfectly fine, uh, because as it turns out, uh, black absolutely does not have to care about losing this pawn. Black can now play e6 and just simply solidify their control of the center. Uh, and after queen takes b7, grabbing that pawn, knight d7, uh, you cannot grab the pawn on c6 safely, because after queen takes c6, rook c8, you have a very deadly attack down the c-file. And this is very uncomfortable for whites, because white is making too many queen moves in the opening, violating that opening principle, uh, and is going to fall behind very quickly in terms of central control and in terms of development. Uh, learn ability is a C as well, mainly because you have to memorize some of these lines if you want to uh, properly utilize the grob. It is a very tactical opening, of course. Uh, frequency, though, is a B, uh, because admittedly it is not too hard. It is just the first move G4 and then bishop G2. That's really all there is to it, and black really doesn't have a way of denying you that. So frequency is pretty high. Next up in the C tier category is an interesting one. I'm going to put the Joko Piano in the C tier, and you might be looking at these grades on the side and being, wow, that is very polarized. How do we get here? Well, Joko Piano goes E4, E5, uh, Knight F3, oops, apologies, uh, Knight F3, Knight C6, Bishop C4, Bishop C5, and now we have C3 with the idea of pushing D4, black plays Knight F6, uh, attacking the pawn on E4, and now white has two options. There's the Pianissimo and there's the Piano. And of Joko Piano goes d4. Uh, and Joko Piano is played quite reasonably at upper levels, uh, both at the uh, mid, like expert, uh, national master, and also to some degree at the GM level. Uh, so solidity is extremely high. This is very well studied. Uh, white has a slight advantage here, and games can be very exciting. Learnability is also B, assuming you get to the spot. Yes, there are a couple moves you have to learn. For example, after takes, takes, bishop b4, uh, white has some options they have to know. Uh, you can take the safe route with bishop d2, which preserves all the pawns, or there's the gambit route after knight c3. And now white has to know what to do in the case of bishop takes c3, in the case of d5, in the case of knight e4, in the case of just castles. So there are a lot of lines here. Uh, so, But the general plan is the same. You're looking to take control of the center, and if your opponent looks to disrupt that center, then you're looking to gambit and attack this centralized king uh, if they don't castle quickly enough. And frequency, however, is what drags this opening all the way down to C for me, despite all those good qualities I said. Uh, of course, you're basically never going to accomplish this opening. It's one, two, three, f uh, four, sorry, uh, four moves. And then, of course, your opponent has to play knight f6 here, five moves if you want to count that. Uh, so very uh, much like the fried liver, it is extremely infrequent that you will come up on this. Uh, your opponent could play the four knights instead, which mean, would mean you have to defend the e-pawn too early, uh, such as if they played instead of bishop c5 here, uh, they could have played knight f6. And, of course, they could have uh, tried to do something else here after c3. Such as, for example, ninety five, right? Or such as d six. So, uh, frequency is even lower than a fried liver uh, because you are adding that extra move, and that's the reason why I really don't recommend it for beginners. The only reason why it's not a fail is because that solidity is so high that even though it's a waste, it would be a waste of time for a beginner to learn this. I do think it provides some long run benefits as you get higher and higher in rating. You'll probably use this more and more often. And that's actually a perfect segue into the Jerome Gambit, uh, which is our next entrance into the C category. Uh, as you can see, C's across the board, and these are actually very low C's, and I'll discuss why. Because in this position, uh, the Jerome Gambit now goes bishop takes f7 check, uh, just very randomly. And now after king takes f7, we have knight takes e5 check as the primary follow-up, uh, removing all of the pawns in front of black's king at the cost of the bishop and the knight. And now the usual follow-up is queen h5, trying to fork the king and the knight. Uh, this is not good. Uh, solidity is very low, uh, as is also learnability, as it's, yes, the follow-up from here is 
arguably a little bit obvious for white. You're bringing the knight out, right? You're bringing the bishop out, you're going to castle. But of course, black is going to not just sit there and take it. And what you're going to find is your queen's going to get harassed. Uh, your your pieces development is going to get uh, hindered. Uh, for example, if you try to push to f-pawn, you won't be able to castle kingside anymore and actually use that f-file. Uh, frequency is also a C for the same reasons as a fried liver uh, and similar to uh, Joko Piano as well, where you had to get into that Italian position uh, with the knight on f3 and the bishop on c4. Uh, sorry, knight on f3 and the bishop. Wow, cannot draw arrows. With the knight on f3 and the bishop on c4. Uh, and of course, your opponent isn't necessarily going to go into that. And so it's not going to be very reliable to get this in a game. Still, it can be fun to play. Uh, and this is going into a low C, but it is going into C tier for me. So next up is going to be the Polish. And the Polish is, you're going to see, very similar to the Grob. I rated it the same as the Grob as well. And you're going to start with the move B4, uh, mirroring the Grob's G4. And the idea is after either E5 or E6, which are the natural two moves, I'll say E6, you're going to play Bishop B2 and counterattack. If the pawn goes to E6, of course you counterattack on the g7 square. If the pawn went to e5, you counterattack the e5 pawn. Now, of course, either way, if black captures on b4 now with the bishop, uh, you're going to get to recapture on e5 in the idea, uh, or g7 in the e6 line. And the idea is that this is in sort of indirect defense of the b pawn. But of course, uh, if you were looking to fee and shadow your bishop, uh, b3 is just a way better option. Uh, there are also plenty of other openings. You can play a queen's Indian for white if you want. Uh, and play b3, bishop b2, and that would be significantly better. Uh, solidity is quite low because of that. Uh, for example, after bishop takes b b4, uh, bishop takes e5, knight f6 here, uh, where you're going to find is that white is going to have a lot of trouble developing because basically uh, all the pieces are on the front rank and you've moved the same piece twice, and you've also moved this b pawn for some reason. And so white is going to have a lot of trouble developing their pieces uh, onto the board in an effective manner. And so solidity is C, learnability is C, because black has actually quite a few options, surprisingly, in dealing with this. Uh, black could have also opted uh, into, let's say, knight f6 on the first turn, uh, and then they have ideas like e setting up with e6, d5, uh, and c5. Uh, they could have also gone e6 on the first move, uh, there's, of course, a lot of options for black. Black can also just completely ignore this and play d5 uh, as well. And let's say go c5 on the second move like that. So it's not very uh, easy to learn. Frequency, again, similar to Grob, is in fact a b. Sure, your opponent's not likely to be able to do too much to stop you here. There's a couple of weird things, but not too many. So frequency is a B. You are going to get this position if you want it, but you're really giving black a lot of agency, you're giving black a lot of control of the center, and I don't recommend this for beginners. All right, next up is going to be the Smith Mora, which goes uh, E4, and now black responds with the Sicilian in C5, and white plays D4, immediately sacrificing the pawn on D4, uh, and plans after C takes D4, of course, not to recapture with the queen, which would walk into a knight attack, but play c3 and gambit another pawn away. Uh, this is somewhat similar to the Danish uh, at first glance, but it actually plays quite differently, mainly because the primary ideas of attacking on f7 don't really work, uh, because the bishop, uh, of course you're probably not playing bishop c4 here, uh, but the bishop is going to be blocked by this e pawn on e6. And this is what puts the smith mora into c tier for me, uh, whereas uh, Danish is not going to be. In fact, Smith Moore is the last uh, opening in C tier. And it's in here mainly because rather than playing tactically and aggressively, Smith Moore ends up relying on more memorization and general strategy instead. Uh, and that is not very conducive for new players, and I wouldn't recommend it that much. It is reasonably solid. I actually had a uh, National Master friend uh, who played this all the time when he was young. Uh, and it is quite reasonably solid, but uh, black does uh, manage to equalize in quite a few variations. And furthermore, there are a lot of variations to cover. Uh, and of course, uh, frequency is not the greatest either. Opponent has to play the Sicilian, has to accept the gambit, has to not give the pawn back in any way. 
uh, or play some other variation. So Smith Mora is not bad if you know it. The main problem is learning it and getting to use it uh, enough times in an actual game. And Smith Mora is really best to use to uh, not as a standalone opening that you want to play, but as a supplement to another opening, such as if you're already a Danish player. But once again, the, the patterns are going to be quite different between this and the Danish. So it won't necessarily be easy to learn either. So we're finally entering the B tier. And our first opening we're going to go over is the advanced or the advanced Karo Khan, which goes E4. And of course, Black now plays the Karo Khan, which is C6. And of course, their idea is to play D5 and challenge your center using their side pawn and trying to play like so against your advanced central pawn. And the advanced Karokan says, I don't want to deal with that. We play the move e5 and grab control of this center. Now, solidity is an absolute A. This is, in fact, the way that uh, that Karokan is played at the highest level. In fact, the reason why Karokan isn't played at the highest level because the advanced Karo is too good for white. Uh, so solidity is very high up there. This is a very good opening for white. But my main gripe with it and the reason why it's going into B tier and not A tier is that I think learnability is too low. And what do I mean by that? Well, there are a lot of things you have to learn as white, uh, mainly dealing with C5 and Bishop F5. And it's hard to deal with both. C5 uh, has multiple ways. C3, Knight F3, captures. All are sort of iffy to learn. Uh, if you play something like c3, uh, it's not very clear what white's game plan is here. Uh, you're kind of going to settle into a French-like structure after something like uh, bishop f5 or even e6 immediately. Uh, sorry, or even e6 immediately, which, uh, one of, again, another one of my national master friends does play. Um, and it's not very clear what white's game plan is going to be, you know, uh, because it's going to be a very close position. Uh, and black has the option to get rid of this light squared bishop weakness if they so choose. Uh, there's also bishop f5, uh, and again, most lines here, knight f3, c3, uh, aren't really going to have any clear game plan, and that's my main problem here. You can learn these first few moves, but it's very hard to think of, you know, what are you actually planning to do in the advanced caro? There is no very clear thing to do. Uh, the exception might be the tall variation, which is h4. Uh, and now, of course, if black plays e6, you're going to be able to trap that bishop with g4, uh, h5, and h f3, covering all of the bishop's retreats. Uh, but of course, your opponent probably isn't going to blunder that, going to move that h pawn up. Uh, and again, it's not very clear what white's game plan is. Uh, if you're looking to play something like e6, play this more sacrificial line, um, it is certainly possible, uh, like bishop d3 and e6, of course, and getting the queen to g6. But there's not much to do after that. Uh, again, it's just too much memorization, in my opinion. Uh, too many lines. Uh, and it's a game plan is too often very unclear, very undefinable. And that's why I'm putting learnability in C tier, which is what drags down the advanced caro. Still, of course, a very good opening. And if you do want to learn it, by all means, go ahead. Uh, the B tier openings are quite reasonable to learn. Uh, it's just that you'll probably have a bit of a harder time than if you learned one of the A uh, to your openings first instead as a beginner. And next up, we have the Advanced French. And it's actually quite similar to Advanced Karakhan. In fact, I'm going to give it the exact same ratings. And it goes E4, E6, very similar plan by Black, which is to use a pawn to support this D5 push. And now the Advanced Variation, as you can probably predict, goes pawn to E5. Uh, and I'm going to give the Advanced French a low rating for a very similar, or a B rating for the very similar reason as the Karo Khan, and is that, what is White's game plan here? Uh, in fact, White gives Black a lot of agency now. They can kind of decide what they want to do. Uh, there's mainly c5 here, and now Black can decide, you know, how do I want to distribute my knights? Uh, what do I want to do with my bishops? Do I want to trade it? Do I want to put it on b7, d7? Whereas White doesn't have uh, that clear of a game plan. You're probably going to play a close position with c3 here in this pawn chain. And yes, it's a comfortable position with a lot of space. But really, what are you going to do is the big problem. Uh, and Black is going to apply, a good French player will apply a lot of pressure to your pawns in the center and break through uh, before you really get a chance to leverage your space advantage too much. And there can be some very 
uh, uncomfortable variations in the French as well for whites. So uh, I wouldn't suggest playing the advanced French uh, in the beginner level. In fact, for both the exchange French and the uh, sorry, for both, oops, I slipped up there. <laughs> for both the advanced French and the advanced Karakon, there is a better uh, uh, method, in my opinion, of dealing with them. And if you caught my slip up just there, uh, you know what I'm thinking of. Uh, and we'll get into those when we get into the A tier category. The next opening we're going to go over is the English. And the English is very simple, actually. It's pawn to c4. Very simple, right? Right? So... Why am I giving it a learnability of C? Is it, It's just one move. It's just white plays pawn to C4. That's the opening. So why is learnability C? Well, it's C because black has just so many options in this position. Of course, you have C5, you have knight C6, you have C6, you have E6, you have E5, you have G6, you have knight F6. Black has all of the options in this. And basically, I could have rated this... Uh, C learnability and B frequency, which is what I decided on, or I could have learned it, uh, rated it F learnability, A frequency. And because you might also be wondering, why, why did you put frequency as B? Well, I put frequency as B because I am assuming that you are only going to learn probably one or two variations, and that's probably E5 and E6. Um, because if you learn any more than that, it is really just unlearnable for a beginner. Uh, and because you have to learn multiple lines, uh, and you aren't going to get all the lines you learn most of the time. Uh, your opponent's going to throw in knight c6 or c5 every now and then. That's why I put frequency at b. If you argue that, well, it's really just c4, uh, and therefore frequency should be a, you can get c4 every time. Yes, that's true, but that's also kind of like saying, you know, the king's pawn has a frequency of a. And yes, that's true, but learnability would take a hit for that, right? Because now you have to if you're saying that you're just playing the king's pawn, that means you have to memorize every single line of the king's pawn your opponent could possibly throw at you. And that's the case here. Uh, the problem is that the English is so broad, your opponent has so much agency in terms of how they want to play the game, that learnability is really just too low. Uh, because your opponent has too many viable options for how to handle this first move. And therefore, learnability is going to be low. That said, of course, English is very solid. Uh, using a flank pawn to guard the center is always very good. You can think of it kind of in some ways like a reverse Sicilian, although that's probably not the best way to think about it. But of course, uh, just like the Sicilian is very solid for black, when playing any opening for black as white, it's probably going to be quite decent. And of course it is. Uh, solidity, I am going to give it an A, but again, the rating is going to be dragged down by that low learnability, and I don't really suggest it too much for new players. Our next opening is going to be the Four Knights Italian in B tier, and we still have uh, now E4, uh, E5, and the Four Knights go Knight F3, Knight C6, Knight C3, Knight, D, uh, knight F6. This is the Four Knights, and now the Four Knights Italian goes now Bishop C4. And you might recall this sort of setup. This is the perfect position. This is a perfect position game. Basically, we just have the bishops and knights on the correct spots. Of course, the pawn now can't go to D4. Uh, after bishop c5, for example. Uh, but of course, you can go to the second best square. Your bishop will also go to one of the second best squares. Uh, of course, g5, not g6. Uh, and you're going to castle, move the queen up one square. Of course, this is very easy to learn, very easy to uh, play. And of course, it's very solid because you're just following all of the basic principles and you're just adhering basically to the perfect position and playing as close to it as you can. So it's A tier in both of those categories. The main problem is uh, frequency. Uh, you can't really rely on this happening. Your opponent might not play knight f6, might not play e5, might not play knight c6. Uh, there's just, you know, your opponent might play bishop c5 instead, your opponent could play the Scandinavian, your opponent could do any number of things. And so relying on the four knights Italian itself, it's not going to appear frequently in enough to justify learning it. And that's why I'm putting it in B tier. But of course, it's very solid. And when you do get into this position, uh, four knights Italian, or you get in a four knights position, the Italian is a reasonable way to play it with bishop c4. Again, it's mainly just following the principles of the game, and so there's nothing too wrong about that. Our next entrance into B tier is going to be the Grand Prix, which is a response to the Sicilian after e4, c5, you now have f4. And the basic idea of the Grand Prix, uh, as you might expect is to go for this sort of fast development on the king, uh, king side here, right, knight f3, or even sometimes queen f3. You're going to develop very quickly on this king side, 
uh, and castle very fast and launch this attack. Uh, and as is suggested by the move f4. Uh, the main problem with the Grand Prix, and the reason why you don't see it at all in the high tiers, is because it's not very solid. Uh, moving the f-pawn early, of course, presents a lot more weaknesses than it does benefits. And uh, the main issue here isn't even too much the open diagonal, but rather the tremendous weakness that is created on d4, just because you don't spend the move shoring up d4 like you might with c3 or knight f3, or some of the more obvious moves here, uh, nor do you spend the turn challenging the center with d4, rather f4 is very, uh, very maverick way of doing things uh, and doesn't really abide by the principles too well. And of course, you're going to end up suffering central control because of that, and that's why it's not very solid. Learnability is also a little bit low uh, because you do need to memorize quite a few things. Uh, a lot of development options here for black and for white. Uh, and there are also some tricks and traps uh, such as, you know, what are you going to do after e5, for example? Careful about the queen going to h4, right? F takes e5 now. Uh, it's not a very good idea. Uh, and so you do have to make sure not to fall in those because, of course, tricks and traps will happen whenever you move the f-pawn this early. Uh, frequency is an A, though, because, of course, uh, all this opening requires is that your opponent plays the Sicilian, and the Sicilian is a very popular opening. Uh, and there's no, unlike uh, a gambit, there's not too much way to decline this. Uh, and you'll get reasonable enough positions, which is why the Grand Prix is going into B tier. And next up we have the Italian, and goes e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop c4. So a lot like the four knights Italian, uh, except without the four knights, only two knights this time. And of course, you might recall this also uh, from both our uh, Gioco Piano and the uh, Fried Liber. And the reason why the Italian is going to be uh, so much uh, higher in terms of frequency is because uh, there's a lot less chance for black to not do what you want them to. Uh, for example, the Joko Piano now requires your opponent to play bishop z5, and the fried liver requires your opponent to play knight f6, but of course if you're just playing the standard Italian, you're just going to go d3 next move, and there's nothing black can really do about that. Bishop e4 is obviously very bad. Uh, you're just going to knight c3 next turn. It was very simple stuff in the Italian. Uh, solidity is of course also very high. And of course, this can also branch into the Joko Piano if you really want to try that, or the Fried Liver if you're going to play instead of six. Uh, learnability, though, is at a C tier, just because, again, there are a lot of options here for black, uh, including both Bishop C5 and Knight F6, and a lot of options after those options for black as well. And learnability is similarly low to the Joko Piano, uh, because the Italian is quite similar to the Joko Piano in that aspect, in that you're giving your opponent a lot of options that you have to know how to react to. Next up in B tier, we have the Ponziani opening, which goes in e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and instead of bishop c4, we now have c3. The idea being to, as quickly as possible, try and play d4. And this can be effective at the lower levels, especially if your opponent doesn't challenge you, play something like, let's say, bishop e7. Now you have d4, and you gain that space advantage in the center. So that's very good, uh, but the problem is, of course, that your opponent should challenge you if they know what they're doing, and they're going to have knight f6 or d5 prepared. Uh, both of which don't permit you to keep a center for very long. Uh, there are lines, of course, to low, know in this position. For example, after knight f6, you can still actually play d4 anyway. Uh, knight e4, d5, and there are some com complex lines here. Um, similarly, after uh, d5, there is now queen a4 trying to pin this knight, uh, and there can be some danger for black if they happen to not know what they're supposed to do in this position. Uh, but, of course, solidity is going to be a b, because Ponziani does have the problem, fundamentally, of just blocking your own knight in for no good reason, and in some lines you're bringing out the queen too early, so it does violate some opening principles, and as a result the solidity is not uh, tip-top, but it's reasonable. Now, learnability is also reasonable, and so is frequency, as uh, similar to the Italian, it's not too hard to get into this position. Just a matter of knowing what to do once you get there, for the most part. Next up, we are going to have the Roy Lopez, which goes e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and similarly to the Italian, you bring the bishop out, but this time to the b5 square instead of the c4 square. Uh, so, fun story, I actually grew up 
uh, being taught the Roy Lopez when I first started chess. And yeah, uh, chess philosophy, uh, teaching philosophy has changed quite a bit since then. Uh, similarly to the Italian, the main problem is that there are so many lines that you have to know here uh, and so many details that you have to know and understand to properly play the Roy Lopez. But of course, uh, it was taught back then because the philosophy back then was that the most solid things should be taught regardless uh, of how easy they are to learn. You must learn the best stuff. Uh, of course, now for beginner chess, we recognize that the fastest way to improve is to you know, learn things that are actually learnable, right? You start with, you know, algebra before you go to uh, your trigonometry, right? So uh, we have better options coming up soon as well uh, for ease of learning. But of course, in terms of solidity, hard to beat the Roy Lopez. It's been played for hundreds of years for a good reason. Uh, and it's because there are a lot of lines where uh, there is very dynamic play that is very, very solid for white. Uh, it is worth noting, though, that if you're just playing this opening to try and win the e5 pawn, don't. Uh, after a6, bishop takes c6, d takes, knight e5, queen d4, uh, you're knight and pawn get forked. So, you know, don't expect to win the e5 pawn very quickly. But if you are looking to play with Roy Lopez, feel free. Uh, it is going to be complicated, though. There are a lot of game plans, and like the Italian, your opponent's going to have a lot of responses to bishop e5. Next up, and our closer for the B tier is going to be the Tarash French, which goes as expected. It's a French, E4, E6, D4, E5, and we went over the advanced French. Now we have the Tarash French, which is Knight D2, guarding this pawn on E4. Uh, the main problem with the Tarash French is that this Knight is not very good on D2. Uh, it is not supposed to be there. Uh, C3 is obviously the most uh, clear space for the Knight. And you probably should play this for the most part. Um, the main reason to play knight d2 is that you're trying to avoid the win a war with uh, bishop b4, uh, which can be irritating if your knight is on c3. But the win a war is pretty good for white, uh, and you should just learn how to play that instead, in my opinion. Uh, knight d2, of course, uh, now black can challenge or control the center because this knight is not guarding d5, and so there's c5 here. Uh, knight c3 doesn't work because when you uh, go captures, captures, your queen is going to be able to see d4, d5 and work with your knight. And that's not possible with the knight on d2, and you let your opponent grab some extra central control very early. Uh, and of course, black can also respond to it the same ways as knight c3, uh, with, let's say, pawn takes uh, e4, knight takes e4. That's also an option, and your opponent can also, of course, play uh, knight f6 as well. And if e5, there's knight d7. Uh, sorry, knight d7 followed by c5. So it's a reasonable option. Uh, I do like it a little bit better than the advance, but still not what I would recommend. Uh, and we'll see when we go into A tier. Next up is the Alapin, which is a line of the Sicilian after e4. C5, C3. This is going to be our first entrance to A tier. And very similarly uh, to the Ponziani, you're looking to play an early D4. And also similarly to Ponziani, your opponent should challenge you uh, with either Knight F6 or D5. Uh, there are very easy to learn lines here. Uh, after each of those, Knight F6, for example, the main line is just going to be E5 followed by D4. Uh, and you're mostly fine. Uh, and after uh, D5, uh, you've got a ton of ideas uh, pushing d4, you can go knight f3, and then knight a3, and rotate the knight over to c2, while also threatening bishop c4 at some point, uh, of course, assuming your knight is already on f3. And there are lots of options here uh, for white. Uh, there's also, of course, after knight a3, you can go to b5 and look for knight c7 as well. So, Alp and Sicilian, fairly solid, although it is a bit less solid than some of the other options I'll be talking about later in the A tier. Uh, learnability is very reasonable, not tip top because you do have to deal with quite a few, uh, quite a few responses of black, and frequency is also going to be uh, very high, of course, because it's just playing it uh, on the second move in response to the Sicilian. So Alpin is quite decent. Next up, we're going to talk about the Catalan, which is uh, an opening with uh, I don't, I wouldn't say there's a particular uh, move order. But we're going to go over a sample one, which would be d4, uh, e6, and c4, 
uh, d5, and now we have knight f3, knight f6, and g3. And the main hallmark of the Catalan is just pawns on c4 and d4, and a fiend shadow on g2. That's really it. That's what defines the Catalan. There's also, of course, the neo Catalan, uh, where you play, let's say, c4, e6, and then g3 here, uh, and you kind of delay the playing of d4, so maybe something like this. And you delay playing d4 for a bit, and you just focus on getting that fiend shadow and that pawn on c4 instead, and eventually play d4 later, uh, which is more like a ready style, uh, but of course, once you play d4, it becomes a Catalan. Now, solidity is extremely high. This is played at the GM level all the time, uh, including by, of course, Magnus Carlsen, and learnability is reasonable uh, because although uh, the uh, you know there are a lot of moves here and there are a lot of different game plans, they do tend to be relatively convergent. The first few moves of the Catalan will kind of change every single game, but the general ideas of the Catalan won't. Uh, and in my opinion, it is reasonably easy to pick up uh, what to do. And as for frequency. Uh, you might be saying, wait, there are so many moves here, how can frequency be high? And again, the reason is because there's a lot of ways to transition back uh, into this sort of setup. You know, you don't have to start with c4, really. You could have started with c, uh, g2, uh, g3 and bishop g2 if you wanted. Black didn't have to play moves in this order either. They could have played knight f6 first, could play e6 first, could play d5 first. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you can set up this setup, no matter what they really do. Uh, and... We'll see an extreme version of this later on when we go into some systems instead of some openings. Uh, and But the Catalan is very simple, and the Catalan is not too hard to learn. Uh, although, of course, it's not the easiest either, but it's good enough, and it's extremely, extremely solid, and that's why I'm putting it into A tier. Right, next up, we have the Danish Gambit, which goes E4, E5, D4, and now after captures, you have C3. And now there's two main ways after black captures. You can either play bishop c4 to give up another pawn, or you can capture back immediately. I personally prefer capturing back immediately, but either one is fine. Uh, you might be wondering, wait, you have two b's and an a, shouldn't this be in b tier? And I might be a little bit biased, as uh, anyone who knows me personally knows this is what I teach to beginners. Uh, but I, I consider this, think of it as a, you know, sort of like a b plus in solidity and learnability, and that's enough to get it to a. Uh, of course, the frequency is very high. You're just playing d4 on the second turn, so it's not very hard to get to. Uh, learnability is a high b. Uh, you're, there are some lines to think about. For example, uh, your opponent has a couple of ways of declining this with d3, d5, or queen e7, for example, knight f6 as well. Uh, but none of those are particularly threatening to white. Uh, the main reason why Danish Gambit uh, is up here is because of it's being a very, very simple gambit to play. You're gambiting immediately on the second turn, striking in that center, taking control. Uh, and we can see it's not hard to learn uh, the strategy of this uh, opening. The main concept being uh, here, for example, your main game plan is going to be to attack that f7 pawn. You're going to play bishop c7, play queen b3, get the knight out, get the bishop out, right? Castle, either direction. Very simple gameplay from white. And it's not very easy to defend this black. Uh, it's even more extreme after bishop c4. Uh, very similar concepts. Again, not too hard to play as white. So you can, and black has a lot of tricks and traps they can fall into because this is a very uncomfortable position for them. It's hard for them to move any of their pieces. Uh, there's, for example, after knight f6, you have to wonder what the happen after, after, will happen after e, e5, right? Uh, and of course, the bishop has trouble moving because it's tied to the g7 pawn. So. Black will slip up very often in this, uh, which makes it very powerful at the beginner level. Uh, solidity is still a B, because with perfect play, yes, black can equalize rather easily, uh, but that is just simply not going to happen at the beginner level, and I think the Danish Gambit is a very powerful tool if you want to try something aggressive for white and don't want to spend too much time learning uh, the intricacies of a particular uh, line. Next up in A tier, with an astonishing three A's, is going to be the closed Sicilian, which goes E4, C5, and now basically any move that isn't D4 uh, or C3. So you're probably going to play uh, mainly G3 uh, as well, sorry, not G4, G3, or Knight C3 indicate the closed Sicilian. Uh, 
where white doesn't push for a d4, uh, but instead looks for a more slow buildup with moves like g3 and bishop g2, and knight c3, and eventually maybe f4, and reasonably flexible play, but mainly looking to push in the center, uh, as well as on the king side. So close Sicilian is a pretty easy way to learn the Sicilian. Uh, it's not my favorite. I think the open Sicilian is actually better uh, for beginners, but uh, I have some friends who are very reasonably disagree with me on this point, uh, and I can certainly see why. Close Sicilian can be very attractive. It doesn't run into most of the uh, you know, complexities of open lines in the open Sicilian that can happen, where after something like d4, you have to watch out on all of the diagonals, uh, especially against something like the dragon, for example. And so the close Sicilian can be easier to play tactically uh, in some circumstances. And of course, it's extremely solid. And because it's the uh, answer to the Sicilian, uh, it's very, very, uh, you'll get it very often. And so it is definitely a very reasonable thing to learn for beginners as an answer to the Sicilian. Next up in A tier, we have the exchange Karo Khan, which goes e4, c6, d4, d5. And as the name suggests, you exchange the pawns now. So after e takes d4, c takes, uh, or e takes d5, c takes d5, you now arrive at the exchange Karo Khan. And it's really a lot simpler than playing the advanced Karo. And this is what I would recommend to any new player wondering how to deal with the Karo. Simply exchange the pawns. Uh, you, and then just play principled chess is all you really have to do. Develop the knights, develop the bishops, right? Uh, even knight c3 here is fine, but of course you would prefer to play c4 four and attack this pawn. Uh, but very simple development from here, knight f3, knight c3, bishop d3, bishop f4, castle, right? Very simple play, very active play. Uh, and this is how I would suggest playing the against the Karo Khan as white. A lot less stuff to memorize and a lot more playing based on principles, rather based on memorization. And of course, now in the same vein, we now have the exchange French. Uh, very similarly, I recommend this over the exchange, uh, over the advanced French. That's gonna go e4, e6, remember this is the French, and now after d5, simply capture on d5. And now you just play chess, you play, you, know, you just develop normally. Uh, there's really nothing to memorize here, very simple plans. Uh, for both sides here, and you have a very even game. And again, I'm giving this all A's. Uh, very easy to learn, very easy to play. And of course, as white, you have a slight advantage going into this in a similar way that you have a slight advantage going into Karo Khan as well. Uh, next up is going to be the King's Gambit, and it's going to be very similar to Danish, both in terms of rating, as you can see, and in terms of the moves. We have E4, E5, and now F4 is the King's Gambit, the idea being uh, to get black to capture on f4, uh, and afterwards you've distracted their central pawn away from the center. And you can follow up with any number of moves, knight f3, bishop c4, uh, typically more knight f3 these days, as you're a bit scared of queen h4. Uh, but the idea is very simple, and you can get very interesting uh, attacks going, uh, because black is getting rid of their own central control here, uh, of course at the cost of a pawn. Uh, this is a bit of a low a, uh, it's comparable to the Danish. Uh, the main downside of the King's Gambit compared to it, in my opinion, is that uh, in the Danish here, there's no good counter gambit to be played here. Black really only can take as their only option. Uh, d6, d5, knight c6 are all very bad. Uh, but on the other hand here, f4, now black has a very good counter gambit in d5. And if you don't know what you're doing, uh, and this is why learnability is a B, is really because of this D5 line. Uh, white can lose in a lot of situations here if they don't know what they're doing. Uh, for example, F takes E5, almost loses immediately on the spot to Queen H4 check, and now none of white's options are good. G3, and of course there's Queen takes E4, and you have a fork of the King and Rook. And if King E2, uh, you're going to get hunted down very quickly here after Bishop C5 and Queen E4. And your King is going to be forced out onto G3, and that is not very good either. So just be wary of that uh, when trying to learn the King's Gambit. Uh, do make sure you have something planned for d5, perhaps knight c3, perhaps he takes d5, uh, whatever it is. Uh, make sure it's good, make sure it's reasonable. Uh, solidity is also, of course, a bit lower than some of the other options we've talked about, just because it's a slightly unsound gambit. Uh, but it can be very, very exciting uh, and very rewarding to learn. So I am still putting it in A tier. 
Next up, we have the Queen's Gambit, and that goes very similar to the King's Gambit, except on the other side of the board, d4, d5, and c4. Uh, and again, the idea is to distract this central pawn uh, and to gain control of the center. Now, of course, uh, this is a lot better for white than the King's Gambit is, but cannot viably uh, hold on uh, after d takes c4, e4. Uh, there is no check. Uh, that you have to be worried about, so like there was on the king side, and you haven't moved that very dangerous f pawn. Uh, that said, uh, it is oops, sorry, uh, it is a little bit complex in some lines, and of course uh, that's why I put learnability at b. Uh, there are some variations you might have to watch out for. I would say e3 is probably safer, uh, and because uh, after uh, e4 you have a couple of things. That can be weird, but should be 6 as well, although I guess it should be 6 less, so there's d4, or d5, but mainly e5 and c5. And as well, you also have to deal with the Albin Counter Gambit, which is e5, although the Albin Counter Gambit is not nearly as devastating as the King's Gambit counterparts, uh, not nearly as bad for white, uh, and of course, this translates to a higher solidity. In fact, the Queen's Gambit is what I personally played at the tournament level uh, back in my day. And uh, it's very, very solid, very, very good, uh, and can give a lot of the same gambits upsides as the King's Gambit without having any of the downsides of if your opponent knows what they're doing, uh, you might be in it for a bad time. Uh, next up in A tier is going to be the Ready, uh, which goes, we now have uh, Knight F3 as the first move. So I think this is outside of the Sodium Attack, the only time we've had a Knight move as the first move. But of course, it's a lot more solid than Sodium Attack. You're immediately controlling that center. And you're goading Black into playing their next move. They can't play E5, so obviously they play T5. Uh, and now C4, which is why that frequency is so high. Your opponent's almost always going to play D5 in response to Knight F3. Uh, and you're immediately responding similar to the Queen's Gambit. We're kind of trying to distract this pawn from the center. And the ready can play very similarly to the Catalan if they decline to do anything about it. However, of course, they have other options they can capture immediately, uh, at which point you usually play either uh, probably e3 or knight a3 to get the pawn back, and you usually do. Um, but there is also d4, and you might end up playing bit more of a Catalan, bit more like a Benoni style with uh, g3 and d3. Uh, might also be reminiscent of a King's Indian attack, which we'll go over later as well. Uh, overall, quite solid uh, and quite frequent. If you choose to learn it, it will show up very often. And the main downside is going to be learnability because there are quite a few lines, uh, both dc4 and d4, which I mentioned. But of course, black can also decline in various ways. Uh, as well. Next up, we have the Scotch, and similarly to the Danish and King's Gambit, it's going to be a bit one of those uh, low A's uh, of a sort. And we have now uh, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, so very similar to before. Uh, but now, similar to uh, we have uh, to, you know, we had c3 uh, for the Ponziani, we had bishop c4 for the Italian, we had bishop e5 for the Roy Lopez. This time, we have d4 for the Scotch. Uh, and the reason why the Scotch is going to be a little bit higher than these other openings uh, that we mentioned before is mainly because that learnability is a lot better, uh, in my opinion. There are fewer lines to go over here. Black basically always captures, and you have knight takes d4. And, uh, of course, after knight d4, queen d4, uh, there is no more knight on b8 to threaten you with tempo, so this is actually perfectly fine for white. Uh, but, of course, black shouldn't take... Uh, Black doesn't have too many lines here, and not all, most of them aren't that scary. Uh, there's knight f6 is the main line. You also have bishop c5 and queen f6, uh, but neither of those are too scary either. You're really just going to defend that knight, probably with bishop b3. Uh, and yeah, really overall, not, not a huge deal. Uh, there are some forceful lines if you want to go into those. Uh, for example, after knight f6, there's a very long line after knight c6, bc6, e5. That goes on for something like 10 moves. Um, and if you want to force your opponent into that, you, do, you can do that as well. So white does have quite a bit of agency in the scotch, uh, but of course they can also just play mainline scotch, knight c3, and have a very, very comfortable position. Uh, frequency is a B, uh, for similar reasons to the Italian and the Roy Lopez. Uh, 
uh, and learnability is a bit higher, but still, of course, as you said, saw, I did point out quite a number of lines, and you will have to learn all of those. Uh, so learnability isn't perfect, but it's extremely, extremely solid as well. All right, next up in A tier is going to be the stone wall. And for white, it's going to be a stone wall attack. An example line is going to be uh, d4, d5. Uh, and now we have uh, e3, knight f6. Bishop d3, c5, c3, uh, that is c6 and f4. So we have this wall structure in the center, hence the stone wall. Uh, and white puts the pawns on dark squares and the bishop on the light square. Uh, and the plan is pretty simple. Develop mostly normally and then utilize your dark square control as well as your forward f-pawn to eventually launch a very easy attack on the king side. And so the Stonewall attack can be very easy to learn. A learnability is very solid. Uh, you're kind of just going for the same setup every single time. You're going to bring your knights out, right? Uh, you're going to move your queen up. You're going to move the bishop up at some point. And you're just going to go for this attack on the king side. Uh, and this strong structure is maybe not too flexible, but it has its upsides in that it maintains very firm control of the e5 square. And of course, the pawn on c3 here gives your bishop a fallback on c2, so it really can't be knocked off this diagonal, which means if your opponent, uh, or when your opponent rather castles kingside, they're going to be castling into this very powerful bishop as well. So very solid, very easy to learn, uh, and not too much black can do to disrupt it. The only reason, uh, only thing I have to mark against it is there is an opening that I think is mostly just a better version of this that we go will go over later. But otherwise, Stonewall is very, very good. Next up, and our final opening in A tier, is going to be the King's Indian Attack. And that's going to be uh, not a particular move order, but let's say g3 here. Now we have e5, d3, d5, bishop g2, knight f6, knight f3. And this is going to be our main setup for the King's Indian attack, where we've got this sort of structure here. We've got a fee and shadow on the right side. Knight goes to f3, pawn goes to d3. We're going to castle king side in a bit, and we're going to have quite a few options for development, uh, including knight c3, uh, knight c3, knight d2. We could move the bishop out first, or we could keep it here as well. And eventually, we're probably going to play either e4 or c4. So very uh, wide array of options here. And one of the things about the King's Indian attack is that it doesn't really depend too much on what black does. Uh, regardless of what they do, you can usually just go for the setup, which makes it very uh, high in frequency and also very high in learnability. It's also reasonable in uh, solidity. Uh, it's just a mirror of the King's Indian defense for black, uh, which is also very solid. The only mark I'm going to have against it is that you kind of give black a lot of central control because you're not going to challenge d5, e5. Of course, your knight on f3 is going to. They can very easily defend that with either their bishop or their knight. Uh, and so you're you're going to give black full control of the center here. And you're playing white. You really don't have to do that. Uh, giving your opponent full control of the center is kind of something black usually is going to do to try and get some counterplay somewhere else. Uh, it's really not something you need to do as white. As white, you can just take control of the center in most openings. Uh, so no really... Not a really big need to uh, cede so much agency to your opponent like this. Uh, but otherwise, it is very soluble, uh, uh, sorry, very solid, very learnable, and very frequent. And finally, we are done with the A tier, but we have one opening that I am going to place in the S tier because I think it is that much better than all the other openings you could possibly learn as a beginner, and that is. The London. If you haven't learned of it yet, it's very important that you do learn it. If you have already heard of it, your reaction is probably either gay if you do play it, and probably you're quite exasperated with it if you don't play it, because you've probably seen other people play it against you, and it may be very frustrating to go up against. Uh, and it's frustrating to go up against because it is very solid, it is very easy to learn, and it is very easy to get to. And in fact, you entered London after just two moves. And London is not really an opening, as much as it is technically it's a system, which means it's a setup uh, of pieces. So White's game plan is going to be to move, let's say, example moves, going to move this pawn up to e3, 
uh, and then move this pawn up to c c3, you might be noticing resemblances to a certain other opening. And after knight c6, bishop d3. In fact, this is just a stone wall, except instead of putting the pawn on f4, we put a bishop on f4, which accomplishes the same goal of uh, defending c e5 with the upside of not having a terrible bishop on c1, uh, which is why the London, in my opinion, is basically just an upgraded version of a stone wall. Uh, and now we have, for example, let's say, uh, I believe it's, let's count 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 5. So it is back to move, let's say e6. Uh, and now knight d3, knight d2, knight f3, castles, castles, oh, sorry, accidentally ate the rook. Uh, let's say, uh, rook, yeah, accidentally ate the rook again, uh, but let's say rook e8. And this is basically a setup of London, just putting these pieces here every single time. And do this pretty much every single game. Uh, and there are very, plenty of videos going over to London uh, on YouTube, and I might post one myself later. But basically, this is extremely solid. White gets very good control of the center and retains all of the same attacking ideas of the stone wall, uh, with the sole exception that you don't have a terrible bishop on the c1 square. Uh, and that's why, of all of the openings that we review for white, my personal pick for the top opening is going to be the London. And that's all the openings that we went over today all listed here, uh, all from A to F, and of course, with S tier being the London. If you have any disagreements with these placements, of course, let, uh, let your voice be heard in the comments. And once again, if there are any openings that you wanted me to go over that I didn't go over in this video, uh, do also let me know in the comments. I will be sure to reply to you with my opinion of them uh, as soon as I can. And any... Uh, Make sure to look in the description also, as well as any possible pinned comments I make. Uh, if you have a opening that you're thinking of that I didn't put in here, there's a chance someone else already asked about it. So do check the description uh, as well as the uh, pinned comments if there are any first. But if there aren't, feel free to leave a comment about your opening of choice that I didn't go over, and I will get back to you as quickly as possible. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully this gave you some decent uh, guidance on what opening you would like to pick for white if you're a new player, and I'll see you all next time.